So I'm just going to quickly go through a few slides describing the resources that are available. And then uh, tomorrow I'll give you a bit more of a commercial for adding your own and customizing it and then sharing it. Okay. So the, you can have the compute power you, you need at iPlant. The more you use, the more uh, forms there are going to be to fill out to get the access. Um, and the more we're going to ask from you in terms of being sure you really know what you want, being sure that you know that they're going to run efficiently. We can also provide help in running efficient algorithms. Okay, we can provide software engineering help. Again, that needs to go through an approval process. There's forms, things like that. But you can get the compute power that you need. So with a million SNPs and thousands of phenotypes, you're probably going to need more than the resources that you have available in your lab. You may, in fact, even need more than the resources you have available on your campus. So we already have use cases for this where people even in uh, relatively real resourced places with uh, adding in a large number of phenotypes for things like metabolites, you start to need some serious compute resources and that is available to you. Okay. So there's a whole variety of different options. We've just been using Atmosphere. This is really excellent, I think, for testing, for analyses that run on few resources, and especially for visualization. ggplot is really great. You can make plots that show the important things about your data. Okay. You can mix and match that, the R code that you use for plotting, with your other resources. You just input the file, output, output files from your favorite uh, analysis method, import them into your R, and use that for plotting. So you can recombine these kinds of uh, tools. So I would encourage you to play around with things like that. I would encourage you to use the discovery environment that we used this morning for apps that are likely to be used often. So especially things you're sharing with other people okay, and that don't require too many resources because that is relatively limited not, um, in the compute for that. I mean, it's big, but there are limits. The Agave API is where you would um, set up to do very, very large data analyses. You can expose anything you install in the uh, Agave API. For example, you can expose it as a discovery environment app if you want other people to use it. But if you're going to run these really large jobs, you're going to want to figure out how to install them directly onto the high performance compute systems and have those jobs managed, queued, set up, run there. There is a learning curve. I won't uh, kid you. There, it's going to take a little time to learn how to do that. You can request help. So we have a form for that. So you can request a consultation phone call. That's usually something that happens right away. You can get a technical person to help you. You can request much more extensive help. Um, there's a form for that too. It's called Extended Collaborative Support. We're, we'll rename it to something more. Uh, obvious. We've just started the form and the process for that this year. Okay. But you can get the compute power that you need to run the GWAS for the data that you are collecting now. You just need to plan ahead a bit for it. Okay. Things you want to think about. Your population type, your phenotype data dimension, the number of environments and how you're going to fit those environments. Are you going to consider them all as separate factors? Are you going to extract features out of those environments like daily max temperature? What are you going to do um, for this analysis? And not only what are you going to do right now, but what do you think you're going to be, want to do in the future once you have this kind of data available? So generally speaking, those things would play into the size of your data set. Then from the size of the data set, you can think about um, what you want to fit out of that data set. Do you want to fit very complex models? Or are you going to be thinking about matrix inversion or maybe ways to avoid matrix inversion? You're going to be looking at nonlinear fits, um, multiple um, genes at a time. So for example, epistasis. So you can easily do combinatorial fits of epistasis by you know, five interacting genes with no main effect in multiple environments and exceed your compute capacity um, even with efficient algorithms. So you want to think very carefully about what these things are that you have and how they uh, play into the size of the data set and to the question that you have. Okay. So 
for historical population fitting, there's lots of choices. Okay, you want to fit structure or kinship. Um, generally, you can use both, as we just saw, or just kinship. Some people, depending on which population you have, you may, may want both or just one, just K. You can use fast LMM, which is an optimized algorithm for linear uh, mixed models. Okay. And you can use structure to get those. So fast LMM itself has the capability of fitting your structure. You can use structure and then tassel, which is in the iPlane infrastructure. Tassel comes from a buckler lab and fits one of the um, optimized methods. Or a Bayesian method called Gemma from the Stevens Lab at the University of Chicago, which is also available in Atmosphere. So these are color coded. So that which ones are available in which iPlant resource already and already have uh, tutorials and information available. You can fit your covariates, your environments as covariates. You can do this as fixed factors. So that's when you have something specific about that environment. Okay. You can do that in fast LMM or Gemma. You can fit it in random. Those tend to be more difficult to specify the model. You may want to go get statistical help at this point. Decide how you want to set this up. You can fit it in uh, QX pack, which is exposed in the discovery environment, although we deliberately made it a bit simpler. So you may want to install your own QX pack if you really want some of the more complex covariate options. And for in our packages, which you use today. So there are packages that are available for linear mixed models. I also want to point out that um, Dr. Wang can fit, put in iPlant the adaptive uh, lasso for environments, so and that's still available and it's public if you want to try that since w when he was still here. So. Then when we talk about prediction, we haven't really mentioned that yet, and that's going to be the last hands-on thing we'll do today, I think. And that is when you have all your genotypes, some of your phenotypes, so you can make that relationship between genotype and phenotype, but you don't have, you would like to predict some of those phenotypes just from the genotype. So this is very becoming um, a standard practice in breeding. This will save you lots of phenotyping time. It'll save you um, time during the season. So if you can seed chip, chip a piece off the seed, figure out what the genotype is, and use that to predict the phenotype, you don't have to plant that seed and score it. Okay. How you should best do this is still an open question. It depends on the particular species you're working on, the particular complexity of your um, target uh, breeding site, lots and lots of other factors. So there's not a single one-fits-all solution in terms of how to most efficiently predict. You still need to work out how you're going to do that. There's two things we've already installed for prediction. GenCell, which is base B, so base B, base C. This used to be ser also served at Iowa State, but is at the moment only now available through iPlant in the discovery environment. We are going to make it available through the API as well so that we can support larger prediction jobs. Okay. Uh, we may not be able to handle through the discovery environment resources right now the kinds of jobs that some of the larger breeding programs would have. So if you're going to do something like that, please check with us first. BA Tools is another choice. So this is uh, the Templeman Lab from Michigan State University. And what it is is a way of handling correlations that you get, the correlation structures that you get. So it's a Bayesian antidependence model with correlation structure. I think it's quite clever. So, and the folks in the Templeman Lab have installed that for us as an atmosphere image. Then you can install your own. We'll talk about that tomorrow figure out how to install the stuff that you need in, the, in your atmosphere image, and then I'll give you uh, who to contact if you want to do that through the API. There's a lot of methods out there. Aaron's mentioned this. Some of them are going to be a lot easier to use and install than others. So if it's already installed, all the stuff I just talked about, all you need to do is figure out what parameters you want to set. That may sound easy, but there's where you need your biology knowledge and your experience. Okay. So one of the other things you can do is um, figure out what parameters you need to set by testing. So Aaron's going to talk about that tomorrow. So how to use the known truth simulations to test. Test what parameters give you the best detection. Test if your data set's too big to run or it's going to work. 
All those kinds of things are things you really need to think about before you get the flood of data. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at a really long process after you get your data when you're just eager to see the result, okay, where you, you're figuring it out after the fact. I would really encourage as many people as possibly can to do simulations now, even if you haven't collected all your data, and figure out how you're going to analyze your data before you actually have it all. Okay. Installing an app is really straightforward. So if you think it's going to run in your atmosphere allocation, the one, your personal one, go ahead and try it. And in fact, install it. Make sure, try it in some tests. So try some known truth data, try some subsamples of your data, figure out how it's going to work. Okay. Give it a try. If it's not, you're going to need to going to run in your atmosphere allocation, even your extra large size allocation, you're going to need to use the API. So ask for help as you go for that. Okay. We can provide for, uh, support. So definitely encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, one of the ways you get um, approval for support, especially software engineering support, is for, for, by providing a method that's not already available and that will be widely used. So GWAS tools are definitely in that category. If you have one that you think is going to work r really well or you have good um, data that its performance is very good, then that would certainly be a good candidate for making it work on the high performance computing through the API and then exposing that for other people to use and asking you to provide help for that too. So for example, for GenCell, I contacted the developers and asked them for test data sets and examples and they were happy to provide that. That's the sort of thing that makes something really useful. And we are now asking you to do that as you ask for, when you ask for support. You need to commit to giving the examples and helping teach other people too. So to do your own data analysis, you need your input data. And we haven't actually mentioned this at all, so I, I should give it a commercial now. It's GBS tools. So um, the, you, if, if you are doing your own genotyping or working with your core genome center, there are GBS to, tools available. And that's a, a well understood workflow, um, and it will run on the iPlanet in the discovery environment and atmosphere images. Okay. I'll mention again tomorrow the just now developing support for image analysis, but um, managing your images, which is something you should think carefully about if you're going to do image-based phenotyping, and analyzing those images in an automated way. So the tool for that's called BISC, and it was developed by our collaborators who are at UC Santa Barbara. So I'll just give you a little heads up that tomorrow we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, we are eager for people to use this and to contribute image analysis methods to the system that are then available for others. Uh, this is one that hangs people up a lot, file format conversion. You need to be able to do that. And if you're really thinking about um, testing different tools or if you have something that's coming off your custom, custom um, genotype machine or image analysis, you want to think about how you're going to format your files. Um, it's an irritating problem that doesn't scale well. So every, pretty much most of the programs use a slightly different set of conventions for their file formatting. You'll need to look up what those are, check and make sure your file meets those, fix it when it doesn't. So don't underestimate the effort involved in file format conversion. So, and it's something you'll probably need to think about because as I said, it doesn't scale very easily. So there's not a good infrastructure answer. So. Then you need a suitable analysis application. There's lots of those. There's ones that are already available. Okay. Um, if you have a very complex experimental design, however, you may want to talk to people up front, talk to statisticians about how you're going to set up and fit that model. Okay. So most of the software that was out there was written for general cases and not particularly complex experimental designs. It's relatively easy to customize a mixed model the way you want it, but you want to make sure that you have the skill and you have the help when you need it, that you can do that. And then visualization, because it's not really done until you can show other people what you got. So you need that too. 
We write um, support open source. So especially if you're installing on the high performance compute, you really need to have that. We prefer, again, for high performance compute, computationally efficient software. That can be defined many ways. If it's in C, that's good, uh, or Fortran. Uh, also, if it's been carefully designed and tested, if it has checkpointing, things like that, uh, we prefer those kinds of things if you have a choice. If not, we can get you help with the engineering that you'll need. Okay. Also, this is probably the most important one. If you're looking for a particular piece of software, it really helps if you have a lot of people who are interested in using it or who already are, and that the developers are available and willing to help. Okay. Generally, they are. If you contact somebody and say, I'm interested in installing your software because I can't run it on my desktop, you, know, you can get everything from, oh, sure, to, I will help you for the next week, 100% of my time. You can get developer, people want to have their work used. So you can often get lots and lots of help in getting it working for the wider community. So, uh, you can explain the advantages of having it be publicly available and packaged up to any software developer who opens their email or looks at their uh, tickets and realizes that they've taken on this huge support job will be happy to hear that there's an infrastructure that will help them out. But it's a consideration when you're thinking about software packages. Okay. R as a system has this. Very large numbers of people use it, lots of people who know how to make it work. Okay. Any individual packages in R, you'll, you want to check a little bit and see how widely they're used though. So a couple success stories, the API, um, an early version of it was actually used to do a very large association analysis with metabolites in the NAM genotypes in maize, so a very large number of genotypes, and we assisted with the software engineering that they needed to make that run properly on the high performance compute infrastructure. Okay. Another example for prediction is GenCell, the developers helped with the install and they made it available to the discovery environment. Okay, so it's widely used in breeding. And because it comes out of animal breeding, it's often quite complex. So the animal breeding community often has a commercial uh, aspect. So we really needed to work with the developers on gen cell so that we could meet all the needs of that community, including the commercial end of the community. So, um, because it, it's not open source. But we're able to make that work for gen cell. And I really, really encourage you to go to the forum, post your questions and answers. Okay. I'll talk more about this again tomorrow. But you can post science questions, compute questions. Okay. Right now, somebody will answer your question right away. You know, if you have a genotype, phenotype question, question then you know, I or my students can answer those, the science questions as well. Okay. So, I would really encourage you to get in the habit of posting things and then get in the habit of replying as well. So answer stuff. This increases your influence, by the way. You get to be known as an expert. So, and any apps that you install that work really well and that people like, make them public. Let other people use them. Of course, it doesn't really help to make it public if it has a cryptic name and then no documentation. So that also helps to give it a, a good name, make it easily searchable, and then explain how to use it. Okay. And share simulations and data sets. Okay. I really highly recommend that. There's a great community effect from sharing simulations or simulation code. The more pe this is why you have competitions. So network competitions like Dreams, um, GWA, GAW, um, QTL Mass. There are no um, current open competitions for genotype phenotype. GAW is a closed competition. So right now, we're, we don't really have that for our community. And it, it's a, something I'd like to see develop in a more organic and open source way, where if you do a good simulation, contribute that to the public data folder with some instructions. Let other people try it with their method. And in fact, um, we're writing support for that, so that's a whole lot easier to manage. We have a tool called Validate that's going to do that. 